Good morning. Thank you for joining our webinar, Tribal Systems Collaboration. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Nadja Jones. Hi, everybody. This is Nadja. I am a Senior Community Development Specialist at NICWA, and I am very excited to be providing this information to you. I have had uh, multiple years working in tribal communities for tribes specific to system collaboration, and I really want to express my explicit appreciation to the National Center and to SAMHSA for funding this work uh, with multiple tribes. We know that in trying to bring collaboration to the forefront, oftentimes we need to actually identify what it is we're trying to accomplish. Why are we going through all this effort uh, and for what outcome? And this work very much allowed NICWA and its resources to merge very adeptly with National Center resources uh, to create some tools that I hope you find useful and some products that I hope you're able to adapt to your own purposes. So this work was funded through the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. And we originally started working with ACF and SAMHSA uh, in 2002. I am a social worker by training and by profession. And I've been at NICWA now since 2001. I know that when this inception of the collaboration began, I mean, I think it really was one of the very first initiatives that brought to the forefront the need to integrate practice and policy for children that are affected uh, by drug abusing, alcohol affected families and really making strides to understand some of the challenges that these families face and how to help them organizationally and systematically uh, realize that there's opportunity in actually knowing what your barriers are. And uh, Nancy Young and Sid Gardner have really been great, and the staff at the National Center, uh, with Sharon Amatetti as the Federal Project Officer to really guide us in a good way. I want to really begin this presentation with uh, letting you guys know that you're please type in questions to me. I very much appreciate knowing that we're engaged in the process. Providing a webinar is very difficult for me because I am an extrovert. And a big part of being an extrovert is being able to look at people as they receive information. I kind of feed off of that. And so uh, I really would appreciate if you have time, if you have a question, please type it in, and those will get forwarded to me. One of the chief concerns in trying to build a collaborative framework to work within is we have to understand that we're building understanding about the specific needs of these families. And we're really specifically talking about the families that have uh, effect of their substance use on their child welfare concerns. We have families in multiple tribes that have experience in our safe, nurturing environments until alcohol or other drugs are added. And I think that's a huge part for me as a technical assistance provider to recognize again and again that this is only a small portion of our population. I am an enrolled member of the Comanche Tribe of Oklahoma. And I was raised and in the longhouse at the Onondaga Nation in upstate New York. And I have a very strong belief that uh, enriched communities and communities that are highly competent in understanding the needs of their members very much thrive through adversity. And so we're serving a very specific population. And in this presentation, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be describing some of the work of three tribes. One tribe is the Squaxin Island tribe in Washington. They were the very first initi initiation tribe that really provided the very beginning part of us learning at NICWA and through the National Center how to better outcomes for children uh, who have parents that have alcohol and other drug issues and who are in dependency court. That is the focus of this collaboration. There are a lot of concerns in tribal communities. There are a lot of different 
um, areas of need in tribal communities. There's a lot of strengths in tribal communities. But for this particular work, it was children of alcohol and drug-affected parents who had child welfare concerns and therefore were in dependency court. And Coeur d'Alene was the second tribe that uh, agreed to participate. And I really want to commend all three tribes. There was Squaxin Island, there was Coeur d'Alene in Idaho, and then the Seminole tribe of Florida. All very different, both historically and politically and uh, environmentally. You know, each of them knowing their community so well that they were able to pinpoint within a few months of the work beginning where they actually wanted to focus their efforts. And making sure that, you know, NICWA, under uh, the guidance of Terry Cross, we, we have a lot of relationships in Indian country. And I'm very pleased to be a part of some of them and be of service in that way. And I know that uh, we sent out hundreds of letters to tribes regarding this in-depth technical assistance and hundreds of relationships that we actually knew about where a tribe had a child welfare program, a court, and an alcohol and other drug treatment services that they were providing to their community. And out of those hundreds of letters, what emerged was how strong relationships were then uh, for these particular tribes and how committed they were then to creating change. Because the collaboration really requires a three-pronged approach with equal strength in each prong uh, in making sure that we have um, not too much emphasis or power given to one system and not too much neutrality or passiveness from another system. We had some tribes that were interested, but only uh, to the letter of an MOU where they said, OK, well, child welfare and alcohol and other drugs wants to participate, but you know, we're not going to really involve court if we can help it. And then other tribes would say, well, we want to involve court and child welfare, but you know, treatment kind of stands alone, so we could do it with just them doing their own thing. And this kind of work really required an orientation to what collaboration in a very interdependent model meant to these very specific communities that did receive this in-depth technical assistance. You know, NICLA provides these presentations as a matter of course in my work. I just, I get asked and I say, sure, that sounds good. I'll provide more information on this aspect of what NICLA does. But I do want to really recommend some of these products uh, that these tribes created in hopes that you're able to take them and take them to your administrator or your council and say, the tribe has already done a lot of work to help share information or to help build accountability. And we just need to adapt it for us, each tribe being very unique with its own jurisdiction, each tribe knowing the capacity of their workers. You know, I went and provided a training to a tribe, an ICW review to a tribe and uh, a couple years ago. And the lady who was in charge of enrollment was actually the lady who was the daycare bus driver. And that's not unusual at all that have multiple hats. Some of our tribal community members have different roles, given the time of day, given the time of year. And we were doing this ICW review. And uh, Elder came in, and she had all these letters, five or six letters, from the state with her. And she said, as the enrollment clerk, I understand that we're not enrolling right now. And so I kept them. And uh, I know that you were here trying to help us, so I brought them to you. And none of them were opened. And they were all very specific families and children that were in the state jurisdiction, in state dependency court. But this grandma knew as an enrollment clerk, we're not enrolling anybody, so we're not going to respond. And I'm going to go back and drive the bus now. And uh, I mean, I think that as a community member myself, I can definitely appreciate. And I was very glad she brought the letters and we were able to resolve some of the dilemmas that were found in the letters. But I think that communities know best where their strengths are and where some of their workers' skills are. So in order to prepare for collaboration, one of the very first things that uh, we do on site, once we went through the hundreds of letters to the dozens of relationships to the one or two tribes that actively got recruited each year to the tribe that was actually selected, I mean, there was a winnowing process 
there was a process of a tribe recognizing, you know what, we might not be as ready as I thought we were, or a tribe recognizing I'm going to be able to respond uh, really quickly to this Naja, so let's try to get this everybody else on board kind of thing. And what the core piece of preparation came down for each of these sites was how to identify the strong, positive relationships, either the relationships that existed between programs or the relationships that existed between the tribe and the community or the relationships that existed between staff that, you know, we have friendships. You know, I'm, one of my dearest colleagues is David Simmons, and we've worked together now for 11 years. And if he asked me to do something, I would be very prone to raise my hand and volunteer just because I like him. And I think those kind of relationships are critical when we look at a tribal community in terms of what is it that they actually want to change. When they think about the children, the focus of families impacted by substance abuse that are in dependency court, some of this preparation really was documenting and articulating in a process that helped note the challenges and barriers. Uh, the National Center provided some consultant liaisons that were a part of a team that NICWA was on. And some of those consultant liaisons knew a lot more about, say, um, HIPAA regulations than I did. And some of those consultant liaisons knew a lot more about uh, paying for treatment uh, through a state funding stream than I did. And so that kind of preparation to go on to a site and recognize that all this shared expertise focusing on this very select target population um, could actually produce some very positive results. So across all three sites, uh, some common barriers emerged that only came out as a result of convening. One of the commitments that was requested and met by all of these tribes was that when a convening actually occurred, we had mutual commitment from each of the systems to attend every single time. That we did not have a team meeting without each system represented by someone who could actually conduct change or someone that could carry the message of what change needed to occur with meaning. And, and what I mean by that is that there are administrators and there's managers that very much carry the message of this is what needs to occur, but aren't necessarily in the position or the authority to help be a catalyst for that change. And this collaboration required each of those systems to send forward someone who actually had the authority or that effective uh, statement of need or statement of visioning for each of the meetings. Someone who actually could carry it back to tribal council and say this is something that's very important to us. As a, uh, We were at Squaxin, the very first convening of all three systems, and uh, the core team leader, Pam Hammond, she looked up and we were sitting in a conference room that had a couple windows you could see into the hallway. and. These two gentlemen kept walking back and forth and looking in the window as they tried to stroll by very casually. And she started kind of smiling. And I said, who is that? And she goes, oh, that's our tribal chairman and the secretary of the tribe. And I said, Do are we in the wrong place? Are we taking up their office space? And she said, no, they've just never seen all three programs convene like this. So they're kind of wondering what's going on. And I think that's really a great effect. That's the effect we wanted is there's actually people in that room that um, have uh, mutual regard for the outcomes of children. And some of the barriers that came out of those conversations, though, uh, did not point the finger at one system and said, you're doing this part wrong. Um, it did not allow for uh, the blaming of one system for uh, the lack of communication really required uh, some just identifying where are the barriers that families face that have these issues, that are in dependency court, that we want to keep those children in the home if possible, what stands in our way of providing the best kind of services and engagement to these families. This is where the two terms of intervention versus engagement and 
those two terms have a lot of meaning to families and communities. That to be intervened means that you're in the middle of something, right? There's an intervention. You're in the middle of getting more vulnerable, and there's an intervention to try to halt that uh, vulnerable, that vulnerability, you know. And then engagement is that that family member, that family is actually now a part of a different process that helps to serve in a different capacity to help build the strengths of that family. And so that was a big part of the conversation is, you know, do we want to necessarily intervene or do we want to engage in trying to be a helper to this family that is truly vulnerable? I mean, having some of the tribes that we tried to recruit and were successful in recruiting, you know, some of these tribes, they reported having a 96% rate of children that had um, dependency, were in dependency court, 96% of their families had, in child welfare, had treatment issues. That's a very, that's almost 100%. And uh, for a tribe to recognize that and say that's how important it is, that it's so much of our population of families that are vulnerable, uh, recognizing that it becomes a priority then, how can we best serve these families. One of the ways that um, staffing occurs in tribal communities, we found out, is that uh, you're an expert, you have expertise, you have content, you're a content expert in your system. I'm a social worker. I know the origins of my field. I know why I'm in my field. I know the mandate of my field. I understand the values of my profession. Uh, I also know that um, alcohol and other drug treatment providers have this very similar uh, mandate, very similar principles of functioning, very similar vision for why they do their work. And as court does, you know, this has been a real teachable moment for me as a professional and that I really grew a lot more respect for other systems and the very difficult work that they have to do in serving the families that were actually a part of my previous caseload. And understanding that we all have, you know, some good intentions and there could be some systematic barriers in the way that actually occur regularly enough that it becomes habitual that we over time normalize. And uh, so this is a list of some of those barriers that each of the tribes in one way or another identified as they wanted to consider addressing. So when we think about how often tribes get the chance, tribal programs get the chance to sit down and work over a period of time, some of the outcomes for the tribes, they had a wish list of if we had enough time and enough resources and enough staffing, this is how we would change how our systems operate with each other. And one of the very first things that um, came up was a principle, you know, how are we going to work together? And this isn't even a formal uh, it could be formalized. Some of the tribes did have a formal resolution that they passed regarding the creation of these teams or the creation of this model of collaboration. But it was also principles of working together across the program that, you know, maybe for one of the very first times the doors of alcohol and other drug uh, professionals opened enough to train child welfare. And maybe for the very first time the judge is actually uh, letting child welfare and alcohol and other drug professionals into their decision-making process. You know, and so making sure that we had a way to identify what a tribe saw as valuable from their unique perspective, making sure that we understood at a fundamental level that the tribe was going to be able to drive what their priority areas would be, and that uh, NICWA would help. You know, it's always good to be helpful. But that identification of mutuality, you know, that mutual regard, that building of respect between programs, that is really what drove and became a catalyst for the work to be successful. So this is a diagram of an exercise that was provided at Coeur d'Alene. And uh, this is a description of what we put on a flip chart on a big whiteboard across the room. And with all three systems practice, with, with all three systems present, uh, we actually describe, we asked the programs to describe 
what they saw as meeting the definition of compliance. There's some key terms across all three systems I found out that mean something very different to the other programs. And compliance was one of the words. Uh, in child welfare, um, compliance means that a person is not only cooperating, but a person is participatory, and a person is demonstrating affection and nurturing, you know, compliant with a parenting education program. In alcohol and other drug programs, compliance means that they're showing up for their UAs and that they're attending their group therapy sessions or their one-on-one -on -one sessions. There's an attendance compliance. Um, and then in court, compliance means that you're showing up for your hearings and that uh, in a timely way, reports are being submitted on your behalf if you're that family uh, in the case. And the norms for how compliance is measured, you know, that's really where in this exercise it became very, very useful because the dialogue really centered on that building of knowledge about each other's system, where at Coeur d'Alene, we had the tribal prosecutor literally telling child welfare, I had no idea that is what you saw as normal. And uh, alcohol and other drug providers saying, well, it's still compliance because they met that criteria. And child welfare coming back with, well, if you're trying to infer that a child is safe because we've said they're compliant, those are two very different things. And so it really was a good exercise for uh, Coeur d'Alene to go through, they told me anyway, and the definition of family, you know, making sure that the case files that were actually being reviewed, are you counting individual children or are you counting head of household and then number of children in that family? You know, how are your binders, how are your folders, how is your data actually being collected on each case? If a uh, mother, I have, I am, I am a mother with three children. Do, is that for your tribe then? Would that be four case files or would that be one with three children? And that really brought up a whole other uh, topic in terms of how are we serving them and how can we track the quality of services across time. It was a good exercise. Um, this is one of the ones that I um, made up on the fly and it was uh, an exercise that I very much enjoyed doing. If anyone wants instructions on how to do it, it's a facilitated process and kind of let people stew and ponder and struggle and inquiry. It's a very social worky thing to do, but it actually brought up some um, very good common themes for people in people's intentions in the work. This is a slide that describes uh, the elements between these systems as bridges. And they don't necessarily stand alone. They feed into each other. Uh, and it's a very linear way to describe the linkages. And the linkages, um, I'll get more in depth in describing. But I offer this slide up as a description to how a tribe can actually look at how well they're doing one thing versus how well they're not doing another thing. And uh, when we have, for example, uh, number two is screening and assessment. And you could have a very strong, strong programmatic arm that screens and assesses families at risk that you could have within child welfare a referral process directly to a CDS assessor who then offers up, these are your options given your ranking and need and criticality, and here's your treatment options. And within a day, this person could be referred to treatment. But number three is engagement and retention. So after you get them in the door so well, and after you understand the criticality of the dilemma, um, how well does that family remain engaged? You know, how well after treatment is there retention and recovery? How well does the community provide that kind of support uh, for a family that is actually seeking fundamental change in how they actually are existing within a community, from existing to thriving? So these are the eight elements uh, that actually a tribe or a state 
to identify where they want to start. And uh, the underlying values, the identification of underlying values means, you know, you're asking your program, do you understand why we're doing the work that we're doing? You know, the values of a tribal TANF program could be very different than the values of a tribal child protection team. You know, is there understanding regarding why we're doing the work that we're doing across that program, across that tribe? Is there understanding that the value is to protect our children and keep them in the home and keep them culturally relevant to their tribal traditions and practices? In daily practice, and that's, again, the screening and assessment, how well are you identifying and assessing the criticality of either a child welfare concern or an alcohol and other drug issue. In daily practice, how well are your clients actually attending their appointments, attending their treatment plan, and how well are they staying in that program? You know, do you have a rate of, if you have 10 positive Indian parenting lessons or, or 10 group therapy lessons, do they attend eight of them, and do you consider that success? Do you even have that uh, description of what you would say that client is engaged, that client, we are retaining that client over time? In daily practice, you know, this is uh, very close to my heart because this is alcohol and other drug services to children, and that's attending to a child's mental health needs attending to the effects of being in a drug-affected home. I have a particular focus in my own profession to trying to help drug-endangered children. I think that some of our children's mental health ailments uh, really stem from watching behavior that is chaotic and um, learning some habits that are actually the habits of using people, of actively engaged, addicted people. And these children need a very specialized expert care. And those are children, those are children's mental health specialists. Those are our play therapists and our healers and understanding that the developmental needs of a three-year-old are quite different than the developmental needs of a 12-year-old. And how well do these children actually understand the addiction process and the recovery process, and how much of are we able to convey to the children that this is not their fault. They are not to be blamed for their parents failing at times to parent them effectively and safely. I have a fondness for this. I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I have a lot of cousins. And I have a lot of memories of um, being safe and then not safe. And I know that it's critical. We make sure to bring the children into that circle of understanding what can be done and what's not their fault. In joint accountability and shared outcome, this is one of the more critical aspects that require careful consideration at each and every site. Because just saying the word joint accountability and shared outcomes would make stress appear in the room. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, it's just it's very easy to say you want to share accountability and you want to have outcomes that you can say as partners we had this outcome when things are going great. And when things are not going great, when a child has been harmed or when you've had a fatality or when someone is in litigation or when you have turnover in your staff and you can't keep track of literally how many children are on your caseload and how many families are being served and in what way. I mean, that's really where uh, the rubber hits the road for uh, a lot of tribes because um, every single federally recognized tribe I've ever worked for, and there have been quite a few over the years, has a tribal council and a form of government that is its authority. And I have a lot of respect and regard for that level of leadership and being able to come forward as a united front in wanting to improve the outcomes for children of parents that have substance abuse issues is a highly well-regarded uh, movement that tribal councils very much applaud. And the Squaxin Island tribe was the very first tribe to identify they wanted to be held jointly accountable 
for some of the outcomes regarding how well their families were being served. And I really applaud their efforts. They have a very unique political organization where they have, I think, every quarter uh, membership, general membership meetings. Uh, all the programs attend the general membership meetings. And they are able to be applauded or criticized in front of council at this general membership meeting. And all the tribal programs attend. And it's become normalized to have stakeholder input and have that level of accountability uh, actually be a part of the conversation on a regular basis. And so I applaud them. And it's very courageous work. Information systems is an element of these system linkages that is specific to how well uh, your data is being kept. You know, as, as a matter of um, orientation, each of the tribes were asked, do you know the number of children that are in out-of-home care? You know, do you know the number of children that are at risk for removal? Of that number, how many of your families have alcohol and other drug issues? You know, and is that just anecdotal information, or is that information that you're actually able to just walk across the hall and ask somebody how many people are at risk? And that's one of the benefits of the systems collaboration is that uh, the very beginning part for each of these tribes, Squaxin and Coeur d'Alene and Seminole, was that they got to ask that question. And they got an answer each and every time. And I very much encourage anyone to find out that number. Because you compare that number, that rate, and then 15 months later, or 20 months later, when the IDTA was concluded, and that rate was always reduced. So I'm, I'm very happy to report that out. Uh, in training and staff development, this is where a child welfare worker would know their profession, would know the indicators of child abuse and neglect, would know the tribal code regarding child welfare policy, would understand the role for their position and their program within the community, and they would be able to seek and obtain programmatic information from the other two systems, from alcohol and other drugs, or from the court system. On their criteria for acceptance, their criteria for uh, application, what their method of decision making is. And uh, across the board, each of the tribes wanted to improve how well their programs understood each other's criteria either for decision making or for acceptance into program. And it didn't mean that a child welfare worker was going to turn into a assessor for chemical dependency. But it did mean that that child welfare worker would understand the difference between addiction, abuse, and recovery, and what the indicators for each of those were. In terms of budgeting and program sustainability, this is an area that each of the tribes considered in order of importance. You know, How well do you want to understand what's funding your positions? I, I am one quarter FTE. I am um, 0.25 of this program. Am I a recipient of braided funding or blended funding? And what's the difference between the two? How important is it for me to realize that we could actually be contributing some resources from my program into this effort to actually create a new position. And you know that's one of the features of the National Center's work is the Sacramento Drug Court. They have a STARS Advocate program that each of the tribes really took to heart as uh, an inception of an idea of how they wanted to create a position that a child welfare position that actually understood the challenges and barriers and opportunities for an alcohol and other drug affected family. So working with related agencies, this is how well a tribe has relationships with contracted partners, or how well a tribe is serving their community through the partnerships that exist outside the tribe. And so an example would be where Coeur had 
uh, parenting education class that was being provided by Catholic Charities. And as a result of in-depth technical assistance, they maintained that partnership, but they included curriculum that they had actually selected themselves that wasn't uh, off-the-shelf version from this other entity. And so how well is that relationship? Uh, Seminole has a very broad network of foster care and treatment providers, and making sure that that quality was there in every placement making sure that um, the relationship existed between the tribe and the state of Florida in a way that on every single investigative visit, uh, the state of Florida could call Seminole, and Seminole would send out a worker with that investigator every single time. So a tribal family did not have just a state worker standing on their door with no knowledge of the culture and no knowledge of how the family actually was structured. Uh, and uh, I think that was one of the strengths that the Seminole tribe had already had in place before the IDTA was actually a part of their narrative. Building community supports is an element between systems that specifically identifies where is your stakeholder input. Where is your customer satisfaction? Where are other programs going to be able to benefit from this collaboration? This technical assistance came on the heels of the methamphetamine epidemic being uh, arrested. And uh, the methamphetamine epidemic created a real dearth of available housing through HUD, because once you have a meth-affected home, it becomes contaminated, and you can't move another family in there without decontaminating, and who knows how to do that. This was years ago. And building community support at Coeur d'Alene meant that um, as they were building their model of collaboration, uh, the Tribal Housing Authority wanted to be a part of the collaboration, because they had a very vested interest and how the outcomes for families that were affected by substance abuse, um, how those outcomes would actually reflect and how well they could do their work. And at Seminole, there were other programs that came forward and said, we want a part of this too, you know, because it is so impactful, because so many of our families are affected. Um, there were community programs that actually raised their hand and said, we want to be informed, whether it was the tribal school or it was the area high school, or it was early childhood. Um, each of them, in turn, just raised their hand and said, I want to be a part of it. And how well is that building of this support being done over time? So some of the work that NICWA did in the 15 months that were formally in-depth technical assistance for each of these sites um, was creating a way that the tribe could identify a critical area or two or three that they wanted to address and improve. And you know, being able to have a neutrality, neutrality in our role as a facilitator, having a confidential process during the sharing of divergent views, uh, making sure that we had um, at hand resources that we could adapt. Uh, tools that could be useful in this particular context with this particular tribe. And the National Center uh, became really a great resource for us at NICWA in building an understanding of how to measure collaboration. So some of the tools that we used that the National Center had actually created was there is an inventory, a collaborative values inventory. And it's a multiple questionnaire, multiple question survey that helps to establish what mutual values are actually a part of each program. And then there's the collaborative capacity instrument, which is another survey that helps to m measure across all 10 elements how open and able a specific linkage is to collaborate a specific program is to collaborate. And, and what that means is that um, 
how well, okay, so I work at NICWA, well, there's a bunch of people that work here, and sometimes collaboration means for me that I will contribute effort, I will dedicate travel time, and I will lend things off my bookshelf for a new project. And sometimes collaboration means get out of the way. <laughs> sometimes it means not to let the work go on. And when you're needed, they'll let you know, but get out of the way. And each tribe had its own unique understanding of how well each program could collaborate. And that was one of the more meaningful tools that came out of the National Center was this collaborative capacity instrument. Uh, there is a matrix of progress in linking substance abuse and child welfare services. And this has yet to be done at a tribal site because the amount of data needed to actually make a meaningful matrix is in the thousands. Uh, you would need thousands of families to actually winnow through this matrix to actually understand what percentage actually um, achieve long-term recovery. They've, the National Center has done this. Uh, with various states, and it's quite meaningful when you have that large of a census group. But for our purposes, it didn't serve us like that. Uh, there is a manual that my good friend Ashley described yesterday, uh, the Screening and Assessment for Family Engagement, Retention, and Recovery. And that's a manual that's free, it's downloadable, that I have a bunch of in my office if you want one. And we give those out to tribes and at various presentations when they want to understand how these 10 elements can link better to each other. So one of the tools that we used in trying to translate the resources of the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare to a tribal community, and that's really where NICWA excels, is we translate what the other culture says about something with expertise. I mean, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare that's like a dream job. That's the, that's, <laughs> that's the organization that when I was a beginning social worker, I remember thinking we need some place that actually merges the needs of alcohol and other drug-affected families with the issues of child welfare and understanding that court will be involved. And so the National Center with these tools, you know, I love my job and being able to translate the collaborative capacity instrument using the relational worldview. One of your handouts that you got in the email, I heard Courtney say you got a lot of handouts. One of them is a description of the relational worldview. And this is a model of assessment and identifying strengths and identifying areas of opportunity that Nick was used for a very long time. And we use it with our systems of care and our circles of care work. We use it to measure cultural, cultural competence. We use it uh, as a way to assess balance, as a way for an individual or a family to understand that uh, everything is related. And this is not, uh, I looked at the registration list yesterday, and I can't see it today, but um, there's a lot of people that I recognize on that registration list. And so for the ones that I don't recognize, um, this is not a medicine wheel. This is not the four directions. This is not a dream catcher. This is a circle that's been bisected by two lines. And if you were to pull this diagram off, this very two-dimensional, is it one-dimensional or two-dimensional uh, picture and brought it into the middle of your desk, it would be a ball. Okay, It would be a ball. It would be a globe. And so think of it that way, that it's actually um, very similar to when you put water in a balloon and you tie off the balloon, how it kind of wobbles and distorts a little bit. That's what we're trying to measure for an organization and for a family. You know, where is their balance? Uh, one of the fondest terms that I learned in social work school was homeostasis. And homeostasis means that a family will, will seek balance in times of change, in times of stress. Uh, family will seek balance. And in our community, sometimes when a family is affected by alcohol and other drugs, children learn different coping and adult skills. They learn how to drive. Uh, they learn how to cook. They learn how to take care of their siblings. It's not just for tribal communities, but it's 
been my experience that those are some of the roles that older siblings take on when parents are engaged in alcohol and other drug cycles. So this relational worldview was used to help translate the collaborative capacity instrument. This is the model at the individual and family level. Next slide, please. Each of these quadrants are comprised of different elements that relate to each other. You might have to hit it several times to get all the different elements all the way around it, Courtney. Like, just keep clicking it, because there's like, there you go, just like that. Awesome. Sometimes I love technology, and sometimes it's so much better when other people do it. <laughs> so thank you, Courtney. So here's the individual and family level of the relational worldview. And remember I said it was that globe? Well, each of these elements relate to each other in a way that helps promote balance and harmony or helps create disease or helps to create disharmony. And we could dedicate hours toward this model, but we're not going to. And if you want the entire article, then you let me know at the end of this, and I will send you a copy of the article. If you want to attend a training on the relational worldview, then you let me know, and I'd be happy to send you. <gasps> Terry Cross, the creator of the relational worldview, he just completed a video project where he describes the relational worldview in front of an audience in its entirety. And if you want to be sent the link, we just taped last week. I was in the audience. It was kind of funny. Oh, he wasn't funny. I was funny in the audience. And if you want to be sent the link that he's actually teaching the relational worldview, you let me know. And I will send you that link. And that video is actually in editing and whatever they're doing to it until the middle of September. And it's being provided by the University of Minnesota at Duluth. And it takes about an hour to listen to. But you come away from it with a very good, solid understanding of what this model can actually do, what it can actually measure. And for the purposes of this webinar, it's only to describe one aspect of progress that each of these tribal sites had to understand in order to move to understanding how well they could collaborate. So the tribes were given a technical assistance visit that helped teach the relational worldview in terms of balance. And then the tribes were given the relational worldview description and demonstration at the next level up, which would be at the organization and community level. And this is where context becomes environment and the mind becomes infrastructure, and the body becomes resources, and the spirit becomes mission. The, the relational worldview at the organizational level translates those individual elements to the organizational level, where, as an example, in the upper left-hand quadrant, in the individual level, context would actually include your culture, your cultural group, and uh, organizational level, context becomes environment. And so for the organization, socially, where is that organization in terms of getting its needs met? Politically, what is the status of that organization during this very specific point in time? An example of that, each of the tribes experienced with varying degrees of effect on the project is that because of the rotation in tribal council, there was a new council to be oriented at each of the sites at various times, where Squaxin Island had new leadership toward the end of their IDTA cycle, and so it didn't have a big effect. And Coeur d'Alene had tribal council change seats midway through our in-depth technical assistance and then Seminole had a uh, tribal council um, change of tenure, I think, three quarters of the way through their in-depth technical assistance. And it wasn't an entire uh, change of 
positions for every tribal council seat. It was in some tribes, half the council was new, and some tribes only two seats were new. And But there was still that political impact of your informing new leadership then on a project that's been going on for some period of time. So we translated the relational worldview to the organizational level. I have to provide all of this to lead to this because uh, those 10 elements in the framework translate to the description you see in front of you here. Terry, Terry Cross, I say Terry like everybody knows who he is. Terry Cross took all 10 elements and he placed the elements within the framework of the relational worldview. And then we had something we could work with in terms of a tribe being open to being assessed. Because the relational worldview is a different way that we see each other. It's a different way. We don't see each other the way the other culture sees us. I know I had the privilege and honor to hear Wilma Mankiller speak years ago. And she said that she was tired of saying dominant and European and mainstream, and that she was just going to call them the other culture. And I really liked that. And I just took that into my heart. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing. And so taking the National Center's collaborative capacity instrument that took those 10 elements, Terry translated it onto the relational worldview. And each of the tribes then were able to have a conversation about what areas of strength that they see, what areas of need were immediately apparent, you know, where was the low-hanging fruit, you could say, that they wanted to have success on immediately, what could be changed over a longer period of time. Squaxin Island, being the first tribe, actually had uh, the self-assessment as a part of a conversation. It was a three-day uh, kickoff meeting that the National Center uh, provided with NICWA to the tribe. And this was a narrative. This was an introduction. This was uh, um, questions posed in a way that there was a mapping process done of the relational worldview by present staff in the room that we were able to get a really good sound picture of where these three programs saw each other. Tribal council members came into the meeting um, in, at each of the tribal kickoff meetings, and they offered their level of perspective on where they saw immediate need and long-term outcomes needing to be changed. And so Squaxin, you know, the very first thing that they wanted was the development of some kind of collaboration that could help build trust, you know, on established trust. The, um, alcohol and other drug treatment provider had really built up a good reputation for confidentiality. And that was a very long and hard fought uh, achievement. And they didn't want to test it. They didn't want to put that at risk. And so you know, they said, we want to collaborate, but we want to build on already established trust. And they also said that there has to be a way that we can communicate with other systems that actually creates decisions for a family in a manner that helps prevent removal or helps to provide services at that very opportunistic time that a family's open for change. And that's usually their most stressful part of their life. You know, somebody calls on Friday and they don't get assessed till the next Thursday, you've missed that window of opportunity. And the tribe actually understood that we have to be able to communicate about the same family in a timely way. And they also understood because they have a tribal court, they wanted to further enhance what procedures and protocols they already had in place and have that as a formalized agreement between systems. And this is where at Squaxin, they had the benefit of being able to create change fairly quickly. This is where NICWA very first experienced uh, where a state in that particular round, it took 
anywhere from nine to 11 months to get a policy change to the legislative level for approval by the governor that the Squaxin Island tribe was able to create recommendations that turned into resolutions within 60 days because of its location and its council being directly engaged in that process of assessment. So I thought that was very much a strength for the tribe is that they could literally just walk across the courtyard to where tribal council met and um, inform them of the progress for the collaboration project. So Squaxin Island had, uh, and these products are available on the National Center for Substance Abuse and Child Welfare's website. They're downloadable PDFs. And uh, one of the very first things that they developed was uh, procedure for the creation of a wellness team. And the wellness team uh, convened on a regular, I think it was like every other week, and they had actually made their own uh, model of decision making that they would not disband the meeting until agreement was, until consensus was reached. About the, out, about the decisions made for that family. It was astounding. I mean, sometimes the meetings took hours, and sometimes it didn't take too long. But everybody committed to be a part of that process um, until consensus, and that's how important consensus is to this tribe, that they really understood it's going to take staff time to do this. And that's why we're doing it, because we can all say we were all in it together on behalf of this family. So this is the result of the collaborative capacity instrument being provided to the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And the Coeur d'Alene tribe, in a result of having done the survey, I think they had like 43 respondents. And they were able to both get a score using the collaborative capacity instrument formally. They sent out the survey via email and in handouts to everybody. And everybody, I mean, everybody at the tribe who works at the tribe got one. They even handed it out to um, clients. They actually handed them out to families at the daycare. Please try to fill this out. It's very important. But it's, you know, it's a lot of questions. And so the Coeur d'Alene tribe have these scores that indicated to them the higher the number the higher the ranking for these particular elements, the stronger that element was seen as being able to collaborate. OK, so the higher the score, the better able that element is to sustain collaboration. So remember I was saying about how I get out of the way? I don't get out of the way real well. And so they, at NICWA, have to actually say, Naja, this is where you get out of the way. And then I get out of the way. But they can't infer it. They can't hint. They can't wink at me. I have to actually look at them and say, what do you want me to do? And they say, get out of the way. So this was overt data that came out of the CCI for Coeur d'Alene that they could see working with related agencies was an area that immediately was able to be considered as, do we want to improve that linkage? And the caveat for each of these tribal sites, I want to be very clear, is that we did not let them identify 10 elements that they wanted to change or improve. We very much recommended stick to one to three, because you only have 15 months for this IDTA. And so I strongly encourage you to pick between one and three goals, elements that you want to adapt or you want to improve, because you only have 15 months. And that really helps each of the tribes understand, OK, even though I think all 10 would really benefit from some kind of improvement, I'm just going to focus on two or three so it's reachable, and so it's feasible, and that it actually makes sense to council. So working with related agencies, uh, the ability to engage and retain uh, clients in the system was also an element that the tribe found out was, you know, pretty likely that they could have some success in terms of collaboration if they wanted to improve this element. And then they decided to rely on the strength of the values. You know, this team at Coeur d'Alene 
really had the strength of the relationship that existed between staff. If you've ever been to Coeur d'Alene, it's you know, um, in Idaho, and it's about an hour away from Spokane. Beautiful horse country, timberland, beautiful. But basically, you know, where you live is who your friends are going to be. <laughs> you don't have anywhere to go, really. It's awesome, but you better get along with everybody kind of thing. And they did. They got along very, very well. This core team really had care for each other in terms of we're going to try to meet the mutual needs of these families we're trying to serve. So they took this survey, and in getting the resultant scores, I don't know how well you have to take a really good look at the pink inside the model of the relational worldview. If you put the number zero at the center and the number three toward the outer edges, that's where that kind of Likert scale of needs being met emerges. And that's where the collaborative capacity gets identified. And so when each of the elements then were placed on the relational worldview and the scores then for those individual elements were placed on the relational worldview, you can see a shape kind of emerge. You can see where daily practice and underlying values turn into the strengths that this project, this tribe, decided to focus on. That they decided, they looked at the scores, they just had their own dialogue, they shared their views, and they decided, let's focus on the positive. Let's focus on what we do well. And the, relation, the relational worldview maintains that if you are addressing an area of need by using a uh, area of strength, it will naturally improve that area of need. And that was one of the effects for Coeur d'Alene, that they improved how well they screen and engage, and it actually had an effect on working with related agencies and building community supports. OK, so I'm going to get into that more, OK, because that's really what the Coeur d'Alene experience was, is that they identified the areas of strength and they focused on those areas of strength to create change within these areas of need. And the areas of need that they saw was working with related agencies, building community support, and joint accountability and shared outcomes. I loved working for Coeur d'Alene, too. Leona Flowers is just awesome. OK, so one of the things they did, this is one of the resources that is available to you if you, cho if you choose to do so. And that is, there's a process called a walkthrough. And Niatex is the provider of, this, of these documents and how to go through the process. But basically, it means that you or staff actually go through the entire system within the tribe as the family that needs help. And so Leona. And her coworker uh, did this. They actually got on the shuttle, and they went to daycare like they were dropping off kids. And they went to court like they had a court hearing. And they rode the shuttle back down to the wellness center like they had been referred. And what the NIATIX process actually does is it helps to identify uh, challenges in the system that emerge as a result of these over time, the habits of programs to ask the same questions again and again. And I think I'm correct in remembering that um, we worked with a tribe, not Coeur d'Alene, on this process. And they had a family, a pseudo family, that had to give their name and address and phone number 11 times in the same day, in the same community, to get services. 11 times, I'm telling you, my name is Nadja Jones. I live at 11218, blah, blah, blah. I have these many children, Stevie Ray, Marilee, and Jeanette. 11 times, I'm telling you what my problem is. And the NIATEX process helps to articulate where are their systematic barriers. And the tribe was able to change immediately some of this, where they, they found out that if you're getting on the shuttle in the community to take your kids to 
daycare before you have a court hearing. The shuttle wasn't stopping long enough at the daycare for you to run in and drop your kids off and come back out. They were dropping you off and driving on. And so you had to actually plan for two hours ahead of time because you would have to wait an hour for the shuttle to come back for you again to get back up to court. And that was a simple fix for the tribe, where they actually went to the vendor and counsel and said, we need the shuttle to wait at the daycare for 10 minutes, wait, for moms to go in, drop their kids off, and come back out, or dads. And they changed it, and it worked. They realized that in the wintertime, the shuttle didn't go all the way up the hill to the court because it's icy. And they're like, no, we need the shuttle to go all the way up to the top of the hill. Who wants to walk up to the top of the hill in 11 degree weather in the snow and in the wind? And then they changed that. They reckon the court was okay. These are going to always going to be the days that we have child dependency court. And so on these days, the shuttle waits. On these days, we make sure that we wait for people to come back on the shuttle. Very, it was very profound, actually. Immediate changes. Squaxin Island, uh, in their experience in getting stakeholder and membership feedback. One of the very first things they changed was they examined and interviewed families who had been in dependency court. And their tribal court was held in a building that did not allow for privacy for that family if more than one person was in the room in court. It didn't have two chambers. It only had one chamber with the judge and whoever that um, family on the docket was. And so everybody else who wasn't on the docket had to wait outside. And if you've ever been to Squaxin Island, they were actually the host of the canoe journey this year, which was phenomenal, which was awesome. But at that time, if you had a court hearing, you had to wait out in the rain while the family ahead of you got into court and had their hearing. And we had families that actually reported. Uh, we had a attorney actually report that people were waiting in the rain so long that they were actually wet up to their knees that their genes had actually taken water up to their knees. And it had actually become normalized that you're going to wait in the rain if you're going to dependency court. Be ready to get wet. There's no overhang. You're just waiting out in the rain for the judge to call you. And you don't know how long the hearings will last. And so be prepared, because it rains a lot in Squawks. And it's at Shelton, Washington, Pacific Northwest. And one of the very first things that Squawks and Island did was that they moved court to tribal council chambers beautiful cedar lined room, beautiful, two chambers. There's a, uh, and there's a formal uh, like sitting room, and then there's the court. So there's families that can actually wait in dry comfort while they go to court. And I've got to say, um, they would not um, necessarily have gotten that information in a timely way if they hadn't overtly reached out and said at the general membership meeting, we're trying to promote collaboration, what are some information that we need as programs, what could help you? And families raised their hand and said, we're standing in the rain. So good for them. So back to Coeur d'Alene. We had them actually develop a confidentiality form that served across multiple jurisdictions and service providers. And it's actually HIPAA compliant. And they actually instituted formal protocols for staff who were involved in the collaborative process. And that's really changing the mindset of workers, where a worker could believe, I work for this system, and we don't share information with that system. And I've worked here for 10 years. And so they're going back to those workers and saying, we now do things differently. And this is how we do things differently. And it was pretty astounding. This is the tribe. Next slide, please. This is the tribe that actually had a reduction in their drug-affected births by 85%. They actually uh, shortened their screening and assessment time uh, to, I think, 24 hours, in that um, they actually had their wellness and healing center uh, assign chemical dependency assessors on very specific uh, child dependency court days to being having open windows for appointments to be walked in. And that shortening of screening and assessment time actually resulted at the end of a 20-month period 
in a pretty remarkable reduction in drug-affected births. And that's, that's just outstanding. They just decided this is what we're going to focus on. Let's focus. What are, we going to, what are we need to change to make this better? And there was a couple different variations. And one of them very much was the formalization of how the team would actually develop over time. And this is where, you know, for this tribe, the, tri the housing wanted to be a part of it, um, education, the high school wanted to be a part of it, and making sure that the code would actually accept. You know, their code at that time, their child welfare code was pretty general, just one or two sentences, and it didn't naturally support a team that built from multiple programs. And so they had to align the code to fit what the team actually needed to do. And they walked that through council. And at every point, Coeur d'Alene was involving tribal leadership and informing them and letting them know, we're going to need your help. right? In six months, we're going to have something. We're going to need policy change on. We're going to need your help on it. And the tribal council for Coeur d'Alene was very responsive. Squaxin Island actually created a resolution that recognized and showed appreciation for that wellness team and that model. So this is Seminole's uh, relational worldview assessment. And you can tell that we're getting better at our graphics over time. I've had to cut and paste over multiple PowerPoints. And this is the score for the Seminole tribe in Florida for their collaborative capacity. And you can see the shape now that emerges with if you're considering toward the circle as in most need or needing to be addressed and toward the outer edges of strength, then you can see where um, the tribe definitely understood that they had some issues in working with related agencies that they then decided would become a training and staff development issue. And what that means is that the Seminole tribe really focused on bringing law enforcement and how allegations of child abuse and neglect could actually be a part of a community response versus just a programmatic staff response. And they had instituted uh, some protections for staff that were mandated reporters that if I work for the child care, as an example, if I work for the child care and I have a concern for a child in my classroom, I can make an allegation of child abuse and neglect, and I'm not going to lose my job. And so having that protection um, built in over time is something that the tribe really wanted to focus on. And in trying to understand how Seminole responded to their scores, it's very important to recognize that Seminole is um, five reservations across the state of Florida. And they have multiple offices. And at the time, they very much understood that they wanted to provide the very best services to their families, but they also wanted to build an accountability for their membership in terms of take, in, in terms of recovery and taking responsibility. And so um, the tribe created their own code. Remember I talked about the methamphetamine epidemic and how that got intervened? Well, Seminole was one of the very first tribes that I had heard of that actually created code for prescription pill abuse and that they understood that prescription pill addiction was as dangerous to youth and children as alcohol and other drugs was. And they didn't have code that supported it. And so that was one of their areas of focus, is that they wanted to make sure that their code actually protected children, both the unborn and the born. That if you are a Seminole tribal member and you are carrying a child in utero, that child is considered a member of the tribe. And they actually changed their code to reflect that. And I just thought that was awesome. And if you wanted a copy of that code, I need you to email me individually from a tribe. And I have that, and I can send that on to you. So some of the priority areas for Seminole was you know, creating a flow chart, a formalized flow chart that actually shows decision-making points in time and um, how you screen out for protection and in for intervention, and how a community can actually help train their law enforcement. Seminole actually has a practice now that's formalized 
that every single Seminole Police Department officer has to receive cultural orientation from their clan mother network on the beliefs and values of the tribe before they can go out into the field. I just think that's incredible. Every, and every single law enforcement person that I met who was a Seminole Police Department officer was actually glad for that information, that to know it's matriarchal, to know that it's a clan system, to know, you know that if we reach out and ask the clan mothers for advice, that they will actually be more than willing to share what information they have about a family. This is the tribe that had, as a part of their core team, uh, tribal members as a part of an advisory. And those tribal members were current foster parents of tribal children or previous customers of their alcohol and other drug services. And uh, these tribal members were actually able to say with reliability that you know, this program is adhering to tribal values, that you know, how you guys are doing this is actually supportive of our culture. And it really gave a lot of validity to the project itself to have stakeholder involvement that were tribal members. These are some of the products that are in your handouts. And one of the products that I want to draw your attention to is that release of information. The release of information was um, incepted, if that's a word, was originally created at Squaxin, and then it got their Squaxin version got sent to Coeur d'Alene, who adapted it to their purposes, who sent it to Seminole, who adapted it to their purposes. And this is a release of information that crosses all across the programs and is HIPAA compliant, but is also supportive of that family collaborative model of that family preservation team model of decision making, that everybody stays informed on the challenges and barriers for this family. And that was one of the things that very much was important to the tribe, is that they knew that law enforcement was going out for 911 calls on their family members. And they also knew that they were creating this historical distress for a system that only wanted to make sure their kids were safe. And so the professional development courses came from the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. They have a five module training that we provided on site in Florida to all of law enforcement for the Seminole Police Department that actually cross-trained across child welfare to alcohol and other drugs to court. And it was pretty successful regarding building knowledge for other systems. And they've actually formalized it as a part of their professional development for staff. So this is a summary list of the outcomes for each tribe in a very brief version. And uh, each of the tribes have a lot to be uh, congratulated on, because it was very, very difficult work. From my observer facilitator view, uh, it took a lot of effort from each of these tribes to create change that is sustainable and long-lasting way past the time that technical assistance was actually being provided. So how you can get uh, more information on technical assistance is through Linda Carpenter at the National Center. Or you can email me, Nadja, at nikwa.org and ask me in particular for any of the things that I've described, including the tribal code for Seminole. I think that's the only thing that didn't get sent in, and I wanted to talk with you about that before I send it off. So if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any possible questions. I've been speaking for about an hour and a half. Oh, yes, hi, Nadja. Yeah, actually, a couple of questions came in. Um, before we get to the questions, we would just wanted to also make an announcement that we also got a couple of requests for some of the resources to be sent, such as the Safer Manual. Um, we'll go ahead and respond to those requests via email. And there was also a question in terms of how to access the recording of this webinar. Um, maybe within the next two to three weeks, the recording will be posted on our website at www.cffutures.org backslash webinars. So some of the questions that came in are, can you also address the urban Indian community and building co collaborations for children? Yes, both the Coeur d'Alene and the Seminole tribe have tribal members that are 
a part of their target population that are in urban centers. And uh, Coeur d'Alene has a lot of their membership that were off reservation and they reside near Spokane, Washington. And they have had a collaborative relationship with Spokane County for years now where they actually attend, the tribe attends the dependency court hearings for those families and uses the same tools in Spokane County. And Seminole, uh, because the location of the offices are across the state of Florida, they instituted uh, tribal only referral process for allegations of child abuse and neglect that actually triggers the Seminole Police Department and the Seminole Family Services at the same time. And that, so regardless of where you are in the state, whether it's Miami or Hollywood or Big Cypress, you're able to access both the law enforcement and a tribal child welfare worker to help investigate that allegation, that you won't ever just get one without the other. And those, I think that's a part of the packet of handouts, is that referral form for Seminole Police Department and how they track across their database system to the Family Services case file system. Awesome. Thanks, Nadja. We also had a question that came in regarding the Collaborative Values Inventory Score. Um, give me a quick moment. I'm going to try to page back to that particular slide. While I do that, the actual question is that um, let me think. Well, the question is actually, uh, can we further discuss uh, as to why the uh, area of children was found to be the lowest in the CVI scores? Let me go ahead and try to pull up that screen. Yeah, because each, each site had different scores or a different perspective on what needed to be addressed. Oh, children, so they might be talking about the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And that was something that was a priority area that the wellness center, Dave um, Ingebrigtsen, he actually, as the core team leader from the mental health services the tribe, he actually just instituted immediately uh, for ch children. And so it didn't need to get addressed. He said, oh, I didn't even children's mental health specialist. That's why they didn't address it right away, because he just said he was going to address it immediately. I think that I did respond to the question. If you were the person who submitted that question, uh, please go ahead and submit a follow-up uh, question, um, if necessary. <laughs> so there yep. is, are a couple of other questions that came in, with one being, Okay. Does NICWA come in and train or present this information to tribes? Yes. Yes, we do. And if it's something that you want technical assistance on, I would strongly urge you to contact Linda Carpenter um, because the National Center, if, you, um, if you're a federally recognized tribe, you can actually request technical assistance for this particular work. It might not be the length of time or the number of visits that the other tribes received, but it could be very specific to a product or an outcome that you learned in this webinar you want to bring to your tribe. And yeah, we'd be happy to do that. We've gone up to Crow, we've gone to Michigan, we've gone to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So let's see, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you for your participation, and Nadja, we'll turn it back over to you for any closing comments. Thank you, everyone. It has been an honor and a privilege to be on the webinar with you. I wish I could see your faces. Please remember to fill out the evaluations at the end because I do read them. And if you have further questions or comments, you can email me at the address at the end of the PowerPoint. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.